Capit, Part 2 of 3 By Karl Marx Audiobook 2x55 M is a failure, or that only a part of C is sold. We, we have seen that C. M. C, as representing the circulation of the revenue of the capitalist, enters into the circulation of capital only so long as C is a part of the value of C, of the commodity capital, but that, as soon as it materializes in the form of M. C, that is to say, as soon as it completes the entire cycle C. M. C, it does not enter into the movements of the capital advanced by the capitalist, although this advance is its cause. It is connected with the movements of capital only in so far as the existence of capital presupposes the existence of the capitalist, and this is conditioned on the consumption of surplus value by the capitalist. Within the general circulation, C, for instance yarn, passes only as a commodity, but as an element in the circulation of capital it performs the function of commodity capital, and capital value alternately assumes and discards this form. After the sale of the yarn to a merchant, it has passed out of the circulation of the capital which produced it, but nevertheless, as a commodity, it moves always in the cycle of the general circulation. The circulation of one and the same mass of commodities continues, although it may have ceased to be an element in the independent cycle of the capital of the manufacturer. Hence the actual and final metamorphosis of the mass of commodities thrown into circulation by the capitalist by means of C. M, their final elimination in consumption, may be separated in space and time from that metamorphosis in which this same mass of commodities performs the function of commodity capital. The same metamorphosis which has been completed in the circulation of capital still remains to be accomplished in the sphere of the general circulation. This state of things is not changed by the transfer of this yarn to the cycle of some other industrial capital. The general circulation comprises as much the interrelations of the various independent fractions of social capital, in other words, the totality of the individual capitals, as the circulation of those values which are not thrown on the market as capital, but enter into individual consumption. The different relations in the cycle of capital, according to whether it is a part of the general circulation, or forms certain links in the independent cycles of capital, may be further understood when we consider the circulation of M, or of M plus M. M as money capital, continues the cycle of capital. On the other hand M, spent as revenue in the act M. C, enters into the general circulation, but is eliminated from the cycle of capital. Only that part enters the capital cycle which performs the function of additional money capital. In C. M. C. Money serves only as coin, and the purpose of this circulation is the individual consumption of the capitalist. It is significant for the idiocy of vulgar economy that it pretends to regard this circulation, which does not enter into the circulation of capital but is merely the circulation of that part of the surplus product which is consumed as revenue, as the characteristic cycle of capital. In its second phase, M. C. The capital value M, which is equal to P, the value of the productive capital that at this point reopens the cycle of industrial capital, is again present, delivered of its surplus value. Therefore it has once more the same magnitude which it had in the first stage of the cycle of money capital, M. C. In spite of the different place at which we now find it, the function of money capital, into which form the commodity capital has now been transformed, is the same. Transformation into PM and L, into means of production and labor power. Simultaneously with C. M, capital value in the function of commodity capital, C. M, has also gone through the phase C. M, and enters now into the supplementary phase M. C. Its complete circulation is, therefore, C. M. C. P. M. First. Money capital M appeared in cycle I, M, M, 
as the original form in which capital value is advanced, it appears at the very outset as a part of that sum of money into which commodity capital transformed itself in the first phase of circulation, c. m. It is from the beginning the transformation of P by means of the sale of commodities into the money form. Money capital exists here as that form of capital value which is neither its original nor its final one, since the phase M. C, which supplements the phase C. M, can only be completed by again discarding the money form. Therefore, that part of M. C which is at the same time M. L appears now no longer as a mere advance of money in the purchase of labor power, but also as an advance by means of which the same 1,000 pounds of yarn, valued at 50 pounds, which form a part of the commodity value created by labor power, are given to the laborer in the form of money. The money thus advanced to the laborer is merely a transformed equivalent of a fraction of the value of the commodities produced by himself. And for this very reason, the act M. C, so far as it means M. L, is by no means simply a replacement of a commodity in the form of money by a commodity in the form of a use value, but it includes other elements which are in a way independent of the general circulation of commodities. M appears as a changed form of C, which is itself a product of a previous function of P, of the process of production. The entire sum of money M is therefore a money expression of past labor. In our illustration, 10,000 pounds of yarn, worth 500 pounds sterling, are the product of the spinning process. Of this quantity, 7,440 pounds represent the advanced constant capital C, worth 372 pounds sterling, 1,000 pounds represent the advanced variable capital V worth 50 pounds sterling, and 1,560 pounds represent the surplus value S, worth 78 pounds sterling. If in M, only the original capital of 422 pounds sterling is again advanced, other conditions remaining the same, then the laborer receives next week, in M. L, only a part of the 10,000 pounds of yarn produced in this week the money value of 1,000 pounds of yarn. As a result of C. M, money is always the expression of past labor. If the supplementary act M. C takes place at once on the commodity market and M is given in return for commodities existing in this market, then this act is again a transformation of past labor from the money form into the commodity form. But M. C differs in the matter of time from C. M. True, these two acts may exceptionally take place at the same time, for instance when the capitalist who performs the act M. C and the other capitalist for whom this act signifies C. M mutually ship their commodities at the same time and M is used only to square the balance. The difference in time between the performance of C. M and M. C may be considerable or insignificant. Although M, as the result of C. M, represents past labor, it may, in the act M. C, represent the changed form of commodities which are not as yet on the market, but will be thrown upon it in the future, since M. C need not take place until C has been produced a new M may also stand for commodities which are produced simultaneously with the C whose money expression M is, for instance, in the movement M. C, purchase of means of production, coal may be bought before it has been mined. In so far as M represents an accumulation of money which is not spent as revenue, it may stand for cotton which will not be produced until next year. The same holds good of the revenue of the capitalist represented by M. C. It also applies to wages, in this case to L equal to 50 pounds sterling. This money is not only the money form of the past labor of the laborers, but at the same time a draft on simultaneously performed labor or on future labor. The laborer may buy for his wages a coat which will not be made until next week. 
This applies especially to the vast number of necessary means of subsistence which must be consumed almost as soon as they have been produced, to prevent their being spoiled. Thus the laborer receives in the money which represents his wages the changed form of his own future labor or that of others. By means of a part of the laborer's past labor, the capitalist gives him a draft on his own future labor. It is the laborer's simultaneous or future labor which represents the not yet existing supply that will pay for his past labor. In this case, the idea of the formation of a supply disappears altogether. Second. In the circulation C. M. C. The same money changes places twice, the capitalist first receives it as a seller and gives it away as a buyer. The transformation of commodities into the money form serves only for the purpose of retransforming it from money into commodities. The money form of capital, its existence as money capital, is therefore only a passing factor in this movement, or, so far as the movement proceeds, money capital appears only as a circulating medium when it serves to buy things, on the other hand. Money capital performs the function of a paying medium when capitalists buy mutually from one another and square only the balance of their accounts. Third, the function of money capital, whether it is a mere circulating medium or a paying medium, mediates only the renewal of C by L and PM, that is to say, the renewal of the commodities produced by productive capital, such as yarn, after deducting the surplus value used as revenue out of its constituent elements, in other words, the retransformation of capital value from its commodity form into the elements constituting this commodity. In the last analysis, the function of money capital mediates only the retransformation of commodity capital into productive capital. In order that the cycle may be completed normally, C must be sold at its value and completely. Furthermore, C. M. C does not signify merely the replacing of one commodity by another, but also the replacing of the same relative values. We assume that this takes place here. As a matter of fact, however, the values of the means of production vary, it is precisely capitalist production which has for its characteristic a continuous change of value relations, and this is conditioned on the ever-changing productivity of labor which is another characteristic of capitalist production. This change in the value of the factors of production will be discussed later on, and we merely refer to it here. The transformation of the elements of production into commodity products, of P into C, takes place in the sphere of production, while their retransformation from C into P takes place in the sphere of circulation, it is accomplished by way of the simple metamorphosis of commodities, but its content is a phase in the process of reproduction, regarded as a whole. C. M. C., considered as a form of the circulation of capital, includes a change of substance due to this function. The process C. M. C. requires that C should be identical with the elements of production of the quantity of commodities C., and that these elements maintain their relative proportions toward one another. It is, therefore, understood that the commodities are not only bought at their value, but also that they do not undergo any change of value during their circulation. Otherwise this process cannot run normally. In M, M, the factor M represents the original form of capital value, which is discarded only to be resumed. In P, C. M. C. P. The factor M represents a form which is only assumed in this process and which is discarded before this process is over with. The money form appears here only as a passing independent form of capital value. Capital is just as anxious to assume this form in C as it is to discard it in M after barely assuming it, in order to again transform itself into productive capital. So long as it remains in the money form, it does not perform the function of capital and does not, therefore, generate new values, it then lies fallow. M serves here as a circulating medium, but as a circulating medium of capital. The semblance of independence, 
which the money form of capital value possesses in the first form of the circulation of money capital, disappears in this second form, which, therefore, is the negation of the first form and reduces it to a concrete form. If the second metamorphosis M. C. meets with any obstacles. For instance, if there are no means of production in the market. The uninterrupted flow of the process of reproduction is arrested, quite as much as it is when capital in the form of commodity capital is held fast. But there is this difference. It can remain longer in the money form than in that of commodities. It does not cease to be money, if it does not perform the functions of money capital, but it does cease to be a commodity, or even a use value if it is interrupted too long in its functions of commodity capital. Furthermore, it is capable in its money form, of assuming another form instead of its original one of productive capital, while it does not change places at all if held in the form of C. C. M. C includes processes of circulation only for C, and they are phases in its reproduction, but the actual reproduction of C, into which C is transformed, is necessary for the completion of C. M. C. This, however, is conditioned on a process of reproduction which lies outside of the process of reproduction of the individual capital represented by C. In the first form, M. C. P. M. prepares only the first transformation of money capital into productive capital, in the second form, it prepares the retransformation of commodity capital into productive capital, that is to say, so far as the investment of industrial capital remains the same, the commodity capital is retransformed into the same elements of production out of which it originated. Here as well as in the first form, the process of production is in a preparatory stage, but it is a return to it in its renewal, it is for the purpose of repeating the process of self-utilization. It must be noted, once more, that M. L is not merely the exchange of commodities, but the purchase of a commodity L, which is to serve for the production of surplus value, just as M. P. M is a process which is indispensable for the same end. When M. C has been completed, M has been retransformed into productive capital P, and the cycle begins anew. The elaborated form of P. C. M. C. P is the transformation of money capital into productive capital is the purchase of commodities for the purpose of producing commodities. Consumption falls within the cycle of capital only in so far as it is productive consumption, its premise is that surplus value is produced by means of the commodities so consumed. And this is quite different from a production, even though it be a production of commodities which has for its end the existence of the producer. A replacing of one commodity by another for the purpose of producing surplus value is a different matter than the exchange of products which is perfected merely by means of money. But some economists use this sort of exchange as a proof that there can be no overproduction. Apart from the productive consumption of M, which is transformed into L and PM, this cycle contains the first phase M. L which signifies, from the standpoint of the laborer L. M, or C. M. In the laborer's circulation, L. M. C, which includes his individual consumption, only the first factor falls within the cycle of capital by means of L. M. The second act, M. C does not fall within the circulation of individual capital, although it is conditioned on it. But the continuous existence of the laboring class is necessary for the capitalist class, and this requires the individual consumption of the laborer, made possible by M. C. The Act C. M requires only that C be transformed into money, that it be sold in order that capital value may continue its cycles and surplus value be consumed by the capitalist. Of course, C is bought only because the article is a use value and serviceable for individual or productive consumption. But if C continues to circulate, 
for instance, in the hand of the merchant who has bought the yarn, this does not interfere with the continuation of the cycle of individual capital which produced the yarn and sold it to the merchant. The entire process proceeds uninterruptedly and simultaneously with the individual consumption of the capitalist and the laborer. This point is important in a discussion of commercial crises. As soon as C has been sold for money, it may re-enter into the material elements of the labor process, and thus of the reproductive process. Whether C is bought by the final consumer or by a merchant, does not alter the case. The quantity of commodities produced by capitalist production depends on the scale of production and on the continual necessity for expansion following from this production. It does not depend on a predestined circle of supply and demand, nor on certain wants to be supplied. Production on a large scale can have no other buyer, apart from other industrial capitalists, than the wholesale merchant. Within certain limits, the process of reproduction may take place on the same or on an increased scale, although the commodities taken out of it may not have gone into individual or productive consumption. The consumption of commodities is not included in the cycle of the capital which produced them. For instance, as soon as the yarn has been sold, the cycle of the capital value contained in the yarn may begin anew, regardless of what may become of the sold yarn. So long as the product is sold, everything is going its regular course from the standpoint of the capitalist producer. The cycle of his capital value is not interrupted. And if this process is expanded, including an increased productive consumption of the means of production, this reproduction of capital may be accompanied by an increased individual consumption, demand, on the part of the laborers, since this individual consumption is initiated and mediated by productive consumption. Thus the production of surplus value, and with it the individual consumption of the capitalist, may increase, the entire process of reproduction may be in a flourishing condition, and yet a large part of the commodities may have entered into consumption only apparently, while in reality they may still remain unsold in the hands of dealers, in other words, they may still be actually in the market. Now one stream of commodities follows another, and finally it becomes obvious that the previous stream had been only apparently absorbed by consumption. The commodity capitals compete with one another for a place on the market. The succeeding ones, in order to be able to sell, do so below price. The former streams have not yet been utilized, when the payment for them is due. Their owners must declare their insolvency, or they sell at any price in order to fulfill their obligations. This sale has nothing whatever to do with the actual condition of the demand. It is merely a question of a demand for payment, of the pressing necessity of transforming commodities into money. Then a crisis comes. It becomes noticeable, not in the direct decrease of consumptive demand not in the demand for individual consumption, but in the decrease of exchanges of capital for capital, of the reproductive process of capital. If the commodities PM and L, into which M is transformed in the performance of its function of money capital, in its capacity as capital value destined for retransformation into productive capital, if, I say, those commodities are to be bought or paid at different dates, so that M, C represents a series of successive purchases or payments, then a part of M performs the act M. C, while another part persists in the form of money, and does not serve in the performance of simultaneous or successive acts M. C, until the conditions of this process itself demand it. This part of M is temporarily withheld from circulation, in order to perform its function at the proper moment. This storing of M for a certain time is a function conditioned on its circulation and intended for circulation. Its existence as a fund for purchase and payment, the suspension of its movement, the condition of its interrupted circulation, are conditions in which money performs one of its functions as money capital. I say money capital, for in this case the money remaining temporarily at rest is itself a part of money capital M, of M. M equal to M, 
of that part of commodity capital which is equal to P, of that value of productive capital from which the cycle proceeds. On the other hand, all money withdrawn from circulation has the form of a hoard. In the form of a hoard, money is thus likewise a function of money capital, just as the function of money in M. C as a medium of purchase or payment becomes a function of money capital. For capital value here exists in the form of money, the money form is a condition of industrial capital in one of its stages, prescribed by the interrelations of processes within the cycle. At the same time it is here once more obvious, that money capital performs no other functions than those of money within the cycle of industrial capital, and that these functions assume the significance of capital functions only by virtue of their interrelations with the other stages of this cycle. The representation of M as a relation of M to M, as a capital relation, is not so much a function of money capital, as of commodity capital C, which in its turn, as a relation of C to C, expresses but the result of the process of production, of the self-utilization of capital which took place in it. If the movement of the process of circulation meets with obstacles, so that M must suspend its function M. C on account of external conditions, such as the condition of the market, etc., and if it therefore remains for a shorter or longer time in its money form, then we have once more money in the form of a hoard which it may also assume in the simple circulation of commodities, as soon as the transition from C. M to M. C is interrupted by external conditions. It is an involuntary formation of a hoard. In the present case, money has the form of fallow, latent, money capital. But we will not discuss this point any further for the present. In both cases, the suspension of money capital in the form of money is the result of an interruption of its movements, no matter whether this is advantageous or harmful, voluntary or involuntary, in accord with its functions or contrary to them. Accumulation and Reproduction on an Enlarged Scale Since the proportions of the expansion of the productive process are not arbitrary, but determined by technical conditions, the produced surplus value, though intended for capitalization, frequently does not attain a size sufficient for its function as additional capital, for its entrance into the cycle of circulating capital value, until several cycles have been repeated so that it must be accumulated until that time. Surplus value thus assures the rigid form of a hoard and is, then, latent capital. It is latent, because it cannot function as capital so long as it persists in the money form. The formation of a hoard thus appears as a phenomenon included in the process of capitalist accumulation, accompanying it, but nevertheless essentially different from it. For the process of reproduction is not expanded by latent capital. On the contrary, latent money capital is here formed, because the capitalist producer cannot at once expand the scale of his production. If he sells his surplus product to a producer of gold or silver, or, what amounts to the same thing, to a merchant who imports additional gold or silver from foreign countries for a part of the national surplus product, then his latent money capital forms an increment of the national gold or silver hoard. In all other cases, the surplus value, for instance the 78 pounds sterling, which were a circulating medium in the hand of the purchaser, have only assumed the form of a hoard in the hands of the capitalist. In other words, a different repartition of the national gold or silver hoard has taken place, that is all. If the money serves in the transactions of our capitalist as a means of payment, in such a way that the commodities are to be paid for by the buyer on long or short terms, then the surplus product intended for capitalization is not transformed into money, but into creditors' claims, into titles of ownership of a certain equivalent, which the buyer may either have in his possession, or which he may expect to possess. It does not enter into the reproductive process of the cycle any more than money which is invested in interest-bearing papers, although it may enter into the cycles of other individual industrial capitals. The entire character of capitalist production is determined by the utilization of the advanced capital value, 
that is to say, in the first instance by the production of as much surplus value as possible, in the second place, by the production of capital, in other words, by the transformation of surplus value into capital, see vol. I, chap. XXIV. But, as we have seen in volume I, the further development makes it a necessity for every individual capitalist to accumulate, or to produce on an enlarged scale, in order to produce more and more surplus value, and this appears as a personal motive of the capitalist for his own enrichment. The preservation of his capital is conditioned on its continuous enlargement. But we do not revert any further to our previous analysis. We considered first simple reproduction, and we assumed that the entire surplus value was spent as revenue. But in reality and under normal conditions, only a part of the surplus value can be spent as revenue, and another part must be capitalized. And it is quite immaterial, whether a certain surplus value, produced within a certain period, is entirely consumed or entirely capitalized. In the average movement, and the general formula cannot represent any other both cases occur. But in order not to complicate the formula, it is better to assume that the entire surplus value is accumulated. The formula P, C, M, C, P stands for productive capital, which is reproduced on an enlarged scale and with enlarged values, and which begins its second cycle as enlarged productive capital, or, what amounts to the same, which renews its first cycle. As soon as this second cycle is begun, we have once more P as a starting point, only P is a larger productive capital than the first P was. Hence, if the second cycle begins with M in the formula M, M, this M functions as M, as an advanced capital of a definite size. It is a larger money capital than the one with which the first cycle was opened but all relations to its growth by the capitalization of surplus value have disappeared, as soon as it appears in the function of advanced money capital. This origin is extinguished in its form of money capital which begins its cycle. This also applies to P, as soon as it becomes the starting point of a new cycle. If we compare P, P with M, M, or with the first cycle, we find that they have not the same significance. M, M, taken by itself as an individual cycle, expresses only that M, money capital, or industrial capital in its cycle as money capital, is money generating more money, value generating more value, in other words, producing surplus value. But in the cycle of P, the process of utilization is completed as soon as the first stage, the process of production, is over with and after going through the second stage, the first stage of the circulation, CM, the capital value plus surplus value exists already as materialized money capital, as M, which appeared as the last extreme in the first cycle. The fact that surplus value has been produced is registered in the first considered formula P, P by C, M, C, C expanded formula previously given. This, in its second stage, falls outside of the circulation of capital and represents the circulation of surplus value as revenue. In this form, where the entire movement is represented by P, P and where there is no difference in value between the two extremes, the utilization of the advanced value, or the production of surplus value, is represented in the same way as in M, M, only the act C. M which appears as the last stage in M. M, and as the second stage of the cycle, appears as the first stage of the circulation P, P. In P, P, the term P does not express the fact that surplus value has been produced, but that the produced surplus value has been capitalized, that capital has been accumulated, and that P as distinguished from P consists of the original capital value plus the value of capital accumulated by its movements. M, as the closing link of M, M, and C, as it appears within all these cycles, do not express the movement, but its result, 
if taken by themselves. They represent the result, in the form of money or commodities of the utilization of capital value, and capital value therefore appears as M plus M, or C plus C, as a relation of capital value to its surplus value, its offspring. But whether this result appears in the form of M or C, it is not a function of either money capital or commodity capital. As special and different forms corresponding to special functions of industrial capital, money capital can perform only money functions, and commodity capital only commodity functions. Their difference is merely that of money and commodity. Industrial capital, in its capacity of productive capital, can likewise consist only of the same elements as those of any other process of labor which creates products. On one side objective means of production, on the other labor power as the productive element. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.